We are in the book of Genesis, chapter 40 this morning, picking up part three of the life of Joseph. For those that don't know, on Wednesday afternoons around three o'clock, we also have a class going on right now, the life of David. And it's interesting how parallel these two stories are. We have the life of David, who's a bit longer than Joseph's account in Genesis, but the events that they do, the, the, the shepherding, for example, and the fact that they both face adversity from a king is interesting at the very least. So last time we talked about Joseph being betrayed by his brothers, being sold as a slave to Egypt from the the sons of Ishmael, and then we have him succeeding in being a slave or servant for Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and then being lied about by his wife and thrown into prison, and she claims that he was trying to, uh, to rape her. So unfortunately, we find Joseph not having a good time. He's thrown into the dungeon here in chapter 40. Let's see what happens. Chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was, uh, was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them, and they continued for some time in custody. So we find these three are a a team, if you will, in the dungeon of Pharaoh, verse 5. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with his own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with you in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? And they said, we have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And wouldn't you know it? Joseph said to them, do not the interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine were branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Pretty vivid dream, it seems. And here's what Joseph says, verse 12. This is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. And then here is a personal request, verse 14. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me this kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and to get me out of this house. I mean, at the very least, that's probably, you know, by the way, you're going to be restored in three days, but when you're out of here, don't forget about me. Verse 15. Because I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. The chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable. He said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cakes, uh, three cake baskets rather, on my head. And in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked good for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. So three vines meant three days, right, for the last guy to get restored. And so the baker is no doubt thinking, well, that's pretty good. I got three baskets too. Verse 18, Joseph said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days, just like before. Verse 19, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. The birds will eat the flesh from you. Not so favorable. I wonder why he didn't ask the baker to remember him when he was, oh, yeah. Okay, verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. Of all the things, I mean, I, I can only imagine that he's, his life has been spared, he's out of the dungeon, he's thinking about his responsibility once again, but I mean, at the very least, poor Joseph here, 
is stuck in the prison having done nothing wrong. Now again, I've mentioned at the introduction of this particular series, it's always striking to me how we don't have that much detail about Joseph and his nature or character or disposition, but we know that he must have been kind of an optimist. He must have been someone that when life gets him down, as it has time and time and time again, he's still able to trust in the faith that he has in God to restore him and to be the person that he needs uh, to be in God's uh, view. So chapter 41, after two whole years, guess where Joseph is? He's still in the prison. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, the Nile River. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. I don't know what the original Hebrew looks like there. I'm, I'm sure it's rudimentary, but I mean, how attractive can a cow be? I mean, I've seen some good-looking steaks, though, right, in the meat section, so maybe that's what we're talking about here. And they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows in the bank of the Nile. The ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So we have this, this dream interpretation thing that we have to deal with here in this particular account. Um, obviously, Joseph makes mention that the interpretation is from God. And Jehovah God, Yahweh, and he is someone that has a connection with him, so no doubt God gave him that ability. We've not really read about him having that ability before, except for the dream that he had when he was 17 about the other stalks bowing down to him, and maybe that was the interpretation uh, that he took from that was his, his own family. Um, but Whatever the case, we find that the, uh, the interpretation of this dream is going to be very important for Joseph, and in fact, the rest of the known world. Uh, verse 8, So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. And the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and they put me in, in the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with his own interpretation. And a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving us an interpretation, each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. And so Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, verse 14, and they quickly bought him, brought him out of the pit. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. That it's not in me, but God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile, Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. When they had eaten uh, them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as the beginning. Then I awoke. Same thing, verse 22. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered and thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted up after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. And then verse 25, Joseph said, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven uh, empty 
years blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. As uh, It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but then after them will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, because it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream meant that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Therefore now let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let uh, Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt. The land may not perish through the famine. Now let's just pause and consider this. First of all, Joseph being aware of this particular event that's going to happen through Pharaoh's dream is significant. Right? This is a, a pretty wild story. If this is actually historically accurate, it's kind of beyond the point of why we're reading it. We're reading it because we see that there is a man here, Joseph, who has this trust and this faith in God. Just imagine for a moment the narrative if Joseph wasn't in prison for those two years. Imagine if he had never revealed that God showed him the meaning of the other two dreams that were there. If they both were dead instead of one being restored, what would happen? So this particular event, we find Joseph being at the exact right place, at the exact right time to be able to prepare the land of Egypt and even the rest of the world for this great famine to come to Egypt. It's a significant particular moment. Verse 37, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one discerning and as wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only in regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Talk about a rise to power, right? Finally, some redemption. He went through all this negative stuff to be able to be the second in command of the greatest empire the world's ever seen up until this point. Verse 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over, over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in a garment of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. He made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee, and thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh, here it comes, some great names for us to try to pronounce together. Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he gave him in marriage to uh, Ezanath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, and so Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And during the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt, and he put the food in the cities. He put in every, in every city the food from the fields around it. So we'll pause here just for a minute and consider some things here. Yeah, he's redeemed. He was not guilty of trying to be with Potiphar's wife. He was not guilty when his brothers betrayed him and sold him as a slave to Egypt. And here he is finally in the position where he's been redeemed by, by Pharaoh himself. And he is now making the proper precautions and, and lay-by in stores as they may prosper literally uh, when it comes to their, their grain. Uh, one small connection here which is interesting. 
We don't know why specifically we're given his age, but it is interesting that he is about 30, right? Because, of course, Christ, when he was making a claim about him being before Abraham, they thought he was about 30 years old then. And so the idea here is that that's one more small connection to point us to this being a, a redemption, a, sim, a symbol, if you will, of, of, of Christ. If we look over in, let's see, verse 49. And Joseph stored up the grain in great abundance, a great abundance and uh, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it because it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were bo- born to Joseph, at, from um, Asnath, the daughter of Patera, a uh, priest of On, bore them to him. He called the firstborn Manasseh, because he said, God has made me to, to forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The second he called Ephraim, because God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. When the famine had spread over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians because uh, the famine was severe in the land. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the the famine was severe over all the earth. And so we find this great rise to power, this great redemption for Joseph, And wouldn't you know it, the famine was so severe that everyone from all around had to come to Egypt because they had laid up in store. That's going to bring Joseph's brothers to Egypt to find the brother they thought was dead, no doubt, is actually second in command in this great empire. And so we're going to pause here for the morning. This great story of redemption shows us that the faithfulness that Joseph had and trust that he had for God's plan was true. It was effective, and it gives us the inspiration to know that no matter what happens to us in our life, if we remain faithful like Joseph did, we can be redeemed by Christ as well. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you and we thank you so much for these these stories, these narratives, the accounts of the lives of your your people that trusted in you throughout history. We thank you for the the knowledge that you've given to us through your word, that we can read these accounts and put ourselves in their position and see how we might react. We can grow bold to know that you have given us these accounts, that we can trust in you, can rely on you no matter what this world may throw at us. We thank you so much for all the people that have lived who have inspired our, our everyday struggles to rise to the occasion, to trust in you, to be the kind of people you would have us to be in this world. We praise you for all that you've done and all that you will do through us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.